This class is on the M14. The U.S. rifle, 7.62 millimeter, M14, is a lightweight, air-cooled, gas-operated, magazine-fed shoulder weapon. It is designed primarily for semi-automatic use. For the last 300 years, the rifle or musket has been the basic tool of the military. These weapons and the men who carried them could decide the fate of a nation. For the United States, the quality of these weapons was ensured by an institution that supported this effort for 174 years, Springfield Armory. Fighting for the common defense was of paramount concern to the new nation. Henry Knox, as Secretary of War, fought for the establishment of a government-run national armory. This French musket, gentlemen, is the weapon that won the war. But if we continue to depend upon the French for arms, or any European country, we will never be truly independent. The Congress will support a national armory if a location can be agreed upon. General Washington strongly favors Harper's Ferry to support Virginia and the southern states. Yes, we know. And we have agreed that Springfield, Massachusetts is the best location to support the northern states. The falls here will protect from any approach by water. We've used that area before because of its excellent road and central location. We've read your report, General. <laughs> the president will have his national armories. I trust this project will be as blessed as your previous endeavors, General. I appreciate your confidence, Senator. Gentlemen. General. General, thank you. The government already owned buildings in Springfield, and more were built as craftsmen were hired to staff the new national armories. Springfield copied the European system, a rudimentary production line that greatly increased efficiency. Instead of one gunsmith making the entire weapon, a team of skilled workers specialized in different tasks. forging the barrel, shaping the lock. Each musket was similar, but pieces were filed and shaped for that particular gun. The pieces of a lock were filed to uniquely fit each other, then reassembled after being hardened and polished. The shaping of the stock grew from the metal pieces as they were attached. Fitting the barrel into the rough-hewn stock, the alignment and basic shape were developed. By sooting the barrel with a candle, the stalker marked the high spots as the barrel groove was slowly chiseled out. By 1804, after 10 years of operation, the armory was producing over 3,500 new muskets a year as well as repairing and refitting older weapons. Supply and procurement problems during the War of 1812 created new demand for weapon quality and uniformity. Gentlemen, this is my machine, which will mechanically reproduce irregular wooden shapes. In this case, the stock for a musket. We begin with a blank, which has been sawn into the basic rough dimensions of the gun stock. And we insert it into the cutting side of the machine. Make sure it's seated in there properly and nice and tight by using these clamps and turn it so that the flat edge is facing the cutting wheel. Now, on the opposite side of the machine 
is my full-size iron pattern right here. Both it and the blank are suspended in this free-swinging cradle. When the follower wheel passes along the rotating pattern, it rocks the cradle, and the blank passes back and forth in and out of my cutting wheel. And now I'll start the cutting wheel. Springfield Armory was particularly receptive to inventions and innovations. In the 1820s, men like Thomas Blanchard were creating a new world of machinery. And now I'll set in rotation the pattern and the blank. of power for these new machines was water. Wheels captured water power under the floors of the factories and by the use of shafts, gears, and belts transferred the power to the overhead shaft in the shop. In 1794, we had modeled our armory on the European systems. Sixty years later, Superintendent Ripley hosts a British delegation sent to study American technology and production methods. The second generation of Blanchard's machines now offered a new standard of precision. Good, hard English walnut. The harder the better. This machine can turn any wood, even fine American walnut. Simply a matter of keeping the blade sharp. A series of machines were preset with jigs and fixtures to hold the part for a particular cut or series of cuts. Now with this gentleman, we've been able to finish the stocking process with a savings of over 20 minutes in the production. Guides moving in templates next to the piece to be cut allowed workers to achieve a new level of uniformity. Springfield Armory played a key role in the development of what was called the American system of manufacturing. Organized movement of materials and cost analysis began to turn an art into a science. Blanchard's success in woodworking influenced similar developments in metalworking. Contributions from many craftsmen led to a series of basic machining tools, like this milling machine to shape lock plates, Rows of these machines were preset to perform specific cuts. Workers often became quite specialized at a particular task. The concept of interchangeable parts had fascinated the governments of all the major powers for centuries. The army that could quickly and easily repair arms in the field with spare or salvaged parts might gain an advantage. The improvement and evolution of these jigs and fixtures were often affected by workmen on the line, responding to a by-the-piece system of payment. Gentlemen, we will now see the final assembly of the month. Oh, While the machine shops had to be built along the Mill River, assembly, testing, and storage were accomplished in a large square of brick buildings built on a hill above the river. Springfield Armory played a key role in creating early standards of tolerance Gentlemen, and gauging. This is the final inspection. Mr. As the War Department Lee, began contracting for rifles from private armories, inspectors from Springfield ensured that contractors met rigid requirements. Nothing leaves this room until it fits. Here. This interaction between Springfield Armory and these private contractors sparked an exchange of ideas and innovations that fostered a quantum leap in precision machining. Marvelous. 
Springfield Armory was, for a time, in the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, pioneering the equipment and many of the systems that were the foundations of mass production. The mission of the Armory, set in 1794, was to provide the Army with arms in peacetime, to establish a reserve, and to prepare for rapid increase of output in case of war. The Civil War tested the mettle of Springfield Armory. From their protected location, deep in the northern states, Springfield Armory produced a dependable and ever-increasing number of quality weapons. Output of muskets multiplied in a single year from less than 14,000 in 1861 to over 100,000 in 1862, and to double that again in 1863. The Industrial Revolution took hold in America, the pace of technology quickened. Springfield Armory became a center for testing and developing a variety of weapons and accessories. Smokeless powder, magazine feeds, and longer range ammunition created the need for a basic weapon that would incorporate these advantages. Department made a concerted effort to develop a new basic military rifle. The weapon finally developed by Springfield, the 1903 Springfield, or the 03. During World War I, a quarter of a million 03 Springfields were produced for our soldiers, far less than were needed. Lack of funding in the years before the war had slowed the institution's response time. The quality of the O3 Springfield became legendary. It was one of the most dependable, sturdy, accurate, and effective weapons ever mass produced. This evolution continued after the First World War with competition to produce a semi-automatic rifle for the military, a weapon that would reload itself using the energy created by the discharge of the previous round. The design finally chosen for production was that of a civilian worker at the armory, Canadian-born John Garand. In 1936, the U.S. adopted the M1 rifle. Between 1940 and the end of the war, four and a half million Garands poured off the assembly lines. The man with the famous last name preferred to remain anonymous, frequently saying, my gun speaks loud enough for both of us. Thank you. 
1964, Secretary of Defense McNamara decided that private suppliers could provide the necessary weapons. In 1968, after 174 years of operation, Springfield Armory was closed.